All right. Hey, good uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you're coming from. We're on the East Coast today, so we're saying good afternoon to everyone here. Um, thank you for joining us once again. I'm really excited about today's panel because um, Dr. Knighton uh, reached out to us to let us, she's been, she's a nurse in the um, Cleveland area, and she reached out to us to, to sort of talk about um, the infographics that she has that sort of better educates people on what to do during this COVID crisis, how to best protect themselves. And so we just thought um, we should do a COVID series because the numbers are going up again. Not only like just recently, DC's numbers went up in a lot of places. Um, California's numbers are through the roof. Texas, you know, the South has sort of remained at a high state. So we're trying to, well, what can we do to best educate folks about this? And Dr. Knighton came through. So I'm just gonna turn it over to her and Mia Keys, who's gonna continue to educate us. And I look forward to learning more and more today. Absolutely. So, Brandon, again, just to echo what you're saying, we're really excited that Dr. Shanina Knighton is joining us today to talk to us in a practical sense of how, what we need to be doing consistently to protect ourselves and also protect our neighbors and our family, right? So, without further ado, because I think we'll have a robust conversation on the back end, Dr. Knighton, why don't you take it away? Awesome. Thank you, Keiko. So um, first and foremost, even before we start getting into the slides, um, just to share a little bit of background information about myself, I am a clinical nurse scientist and KL2 scholar at Case Western Reserve University, and I specialize in self-management, older adults, and infection prevention. And so a lot of people always ask, you know, like, well, what is infection prevention? Not necessarily what is it, but what does that have to do with what it is that I'm doing as a clinical nurse scientist? And better yet, what qualifies me to make decisions, make practical information? So I always share with them, excuse me, talk about what is an infection preventionist. So we're experts on practical methods of preventing and controlling the spread of infections. We must know pathogen types, uh, where they thrive, test how to identify them, how to eliminate them from people and surfaces. Um, some of my work have even required me to be inside of the lab um, as well as in the active setting and figure out how I would say surrogate markers or surrogate bacteria or fungus would behave. And we base these protocols off of that as well as real world experiences. And so even though you may see an infection preventionist that may come up with um, natural disaster protocols, bioterrorism prevention, the major work goes into the creation, communication, and implementation of protocols, you know, that we do that goes over hand hygiene, environmental practices, device cleaning, anything that you think of. So we're pretty much very nosy when it comes to preventing germs. And so if you haven't heard of an infection preventionist, then I would encourage you to look it up. So how did I get into this work? Um, I started out as a nurse on the floor during H1N1, swine flu, Zika virus, Ebola, you name it. And one of the things that I came across just during that time was, well, if I, as the nurse, um, have to take care of patients, how do I keep them safe as well as keep myself safe? And one of the things that was duly noted was that we did not have protocols for patients to be able to clean their hands. And so I was doing everything that I could to stay clean, but did not know how else to protect the patient outside of them being vulnerable to me as a healthcare worker. So that spanned into research uh, where I started to look at patient hand hygiene more, started looking at pathogens more, technology-based interventions, um, most of the work being in the acute care setting. So that then led to recognizing that hospitals and health care uh, long-term care facilities are not required to provide patients with materials to clean their hands. And so then here we are, community. So if my patients in the healthcare setting did not have information for them to be able to practice infection prevention. The thought was, is that when COVID-19 came along, and not necessarily the thought, but just really theoretically based off of our history with pandemics, epidemics and outbreaks, is that if they didn't have the information then, then they don't have the information now, especially during the time when they would need it. 
So infection prevention practices for patients, which are also consumers or community members, small businesses, public settings, schools, have never had to have infection prevention practices like they need right now in the midst of COVID-19. So talking about COVID-19, I'll cover hand hygiene, social distancing, mask use, glove use, which we talk about, but most importantly, we're here to talk about the infographics. So I'm looking forward to that. And so um, let's just really quick, I wanna do a poll asking about your thought process in regards to coronavirus when this all happened. So um, Keiko, if you can pull up the poll, please. So I wanna know, like at the beginning of the pandemic, um, this is from your standpoint, were you overwhelmed with trying to determine what information was real or not? And I'll just allow like a couple of seconds. Okay, Keiko, can you share with us the results? So we have at the beginning of the pandemic, we have 54% that said they were overwhelmed and 46% said no. So almost close to 50-50, so that's interesting. So I can tell you that when things started happening, many were saying, hey, well, what is uh, coronavirus? What is COVID-19? What is SARS-CoV-2? And I explained to people that it is a respiratory illness that attacks the lungs or attacks our, attacks our respiratory system, um, can lead to pneumonia, and it's bad. You know, we haven't had SARS-CoV-2 occur inside of the human body before, but coronavirus itself is not new and has been around since the 70s. So symptoms-wise, just to go over them really quickly, um, the difference between COVID-19 and a typical cold, flu, or allergies is that you have the dry cough. There are the early signs of loss of smell and loss of taste. Um, NIH did have a study that was released this past May that um, even explained that hiccups is something. And for someone that doesn't get hiccups often, then that may be something that may actually have them thinking if they have some of the other symptoms to go along with it. And so if you could just imagine, it's been allergy season, and so I'm sure people are looking at people crazy when they cough or sneeze now too. Um, but this is a way to just know the difference between a cold allergy, flu, and COVID especially considering that flu is coming off a of vacation, coming up from time soon. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's say that you have any of the symptoms that I just talked about a short while ago. So there are two different types of tests. There's a viral test and there's an antibody test. So you say to yourself like, hey, I think I was around someone last week. They reached out to me and they told me that they were, they tested positive for COVID. So that would um, require you to want to ask for a viral test or you would want to ask for a viral test. Let's say you are one of those people and you're like, oh my gosh, I think I had COVID-19 back in January or February. That means that you had a past infection and you would want to take an antibody test to see if you had it in the past. Just because you had it in the past or you taste, test positive, it does not mean that you are going to be safe from getting COVID-19 again. As of right now, we don't know how long your antibodies will fight for. We don't know their strength in terms of um, how well they fight in order to say that you will not get an infection again. But the reason I would say that the antibody test is important for people to take is because it tells you if you've had it, and with us knowing now that um, the sperm counts are being affected by COVID, we know that diabetes is linked to COVID. We know that there are different types of organ damage that is linked to COVID. We know that clots is linked to COVID. So you will wanna know if you've had exposure to it just in case any of these things show up later on. Traditionally, we, when you talk about Zika virus, when you talk about human papillomavirus, papillomavirus, those conditions or viruses have shown up to have long-term effects that maybe were not detectable at the beginning. 
And if you go in somewhere and let's say someone tries to give you a test or they ask you if you want to be tested for COVID, if they give you, just swab your nares like lightly, then you'll know that they've given you the antibody test and that's not really what you want if you're trying to look at an active infection. If you're looking for the antibody test and they're trying to give you a swab, which is up to the left-hand side of your screen, which goes into your nasal pharynx, then you'll know that that's not the correct test. So we've all again heard about hand hygiene, social distancing, mask use, surface cleaning, all of these things. And we say to ourselves like, okay, we know that we should be doing these things. But unfortunately, if we do not do them right, then they don't happen. And only three to 6% of people in the United States wash their hands correctly. And so oftentimes when we think about hand washing, we, hurry up and we do the front and we do the back. I'm guilty of this, especially like if I'm at home, you know, sometimes. And so we'll wash the front and we'll wash the back. But we oftentimes forget about the fingertips, which can often become contaminated. We forget about our thumb areas, which become contaminated and also like the crevices of them. And then the wrist areas. And so in school and even as a nurse and um, people that are in healthcare can attest to this, that we learn that you go from your hands would be the cleanest and then as you move up the arms and they become the dirtiest. And so many people don't think about that when they're cleaning their hands. Social distancing is interesting. Um, I'm gonna go back there for a second just to talk about it. Social distancing, when people say, okay, well, why is it that we're social distancing? You have people that may not catch their cough and their sneeze correctly. You have people that what I would call are spit talkers, meaning that they naturally have droplets that travel, travel when they talk. You may have someone that is incorrectly using a mask. You may have someone that incorrectly cleans their hands. So to be able to not put yourself in a situation of where you're within the pathway of germs seems most ideal, especially because COVID is transferred through the eyes, mouth, and nose. So, I always tell people to be kind because we were given a crash course in infection prevention overnight. So you see um, hand hygiene is the first offense, but the incorrect glove use. Um, I've seen plenty of people out at the grocery stores or just in different places and they have these gloves on. And these gloves have a false perception that they can keep you safe. If you are using these gloves to serve as your hands, as a way to keep your hands safe, I have bad news for you. The gloves are not going to keep you safe because they're porous and germs can still travel through. And then, unfortunately, the gloves can serve as a vector for being able to transmit germs because you're now allowing those gloves to accumulate germs or a bio burden on them where you then can transfer it to your personal body, to your objects, um, from things that you may come in contact with out in public. Same exact thing with the mask. And so I wanna talk about the mask for a little bit. And so with the mask, um, I'm sure some of you have seen this, people out in public and they put the mask down beneath their chin. The best way to stay safe with the mask is to take it off. Just take it off all the way because let's say that you're in front of somebody. Now, mind you, the masks are not 100% effective. So you're talking to somebody and you're both standing in front of each other. Um, it's catching some of the droplets, but it's not catching all. Our necks are exposed areas. So then those droplets, let's just say, they are on the neck area. You then here actually lower your mask to put it on your chin in order for you to be able to talk, be able to eat something, anything. You then pull it back up. All of the contaminants that were in your neck area that have been exposed to the air are then now being placed right back on your face. And so it's compromising or it's defeating the whole purpose of having the mask on. And so I encourage you that when you eat or drink, it's important for you to take it all the way off. And so just out of curiosity, we have a poll that me is going to share really quick.
So what type of mask do you wear when going out in public? And I'm talking about non-health care. So if you were going out with your loved ones, if you had to go to the grocery store, just go out to have fun, um, what type of mask are you wearing? Okay. So let's look at the results. Okay, so 61% cloth mask, 39% um, actually say that they own multiple types. Um, surgical mask for 21% and uh, N95 and KN95 is 3% and 6%. And I will tell you, I am happy to actually see the numbers be that low for the N95 and KN95. I try to specify to people that in healthcare, we have to undergo what's called an annual fit test in order for us to make sure that they fit correctly. It's not just based off of the size of your face, it's based off of the way that your nose and your mouth are set up and then they spray this chemical in the air to make sure that you can't test it and that's supposed to be an indicator of whether or not the droplets will have a chance to get through if something was um, airborne. So I am happy to see that those numbers are not as high as what they were um, back in April. So getting into the infographics um, really quickly, um, why did I decide to do this? Because I realized that even though we had World Health Organization, the CDC, our county boards, our city um, officials, our government officials advising for us to follow these guidelines, I realized that there was a lot of confusion. Um, there was a lot of information that many did not realize did not necessarily make it to everyone. And the biggest thing is, it's just knowing that people need to be able to see themselves inside of information. So what I did was, is these are infographics. The infographics are meant to engage someone, not just from the standpoint of, I wanna tell you what to do, but I wanna at least show you um, through a visual what it is you should do. And it provides information, not only just digestible by someone that is an older adult, but also by a kid. So something that was intentionally created to go across multiple generations. Um, as a nurse, um, I've been educating people, you know, during my time um, in profession. And so we all know the difference between someone that will read a pamphlet, someone that wants to see something visually. Um, I get it, I don't have the auditory piece, but we all tend to learn differently. And so this is taking the information that we know is being best practices and putting it into digestible chunks and being able to connect the dots. So when NIH mentioned, you know, that COVID can live up under, things, like it can live on plastic and it can live on metal. Well, what things do we have in our day-to-day -day life that we come in contact with that may be plastic or metal? And so when we're thinking about our rings, when we're thinking about artificial nails, these are actually practices inside of the healthcare setting that, not, that are not allowed for healthcare workers because we understand that these things can harbor germs. And so how do we convert that information to the community? And so that's been the objective or the passion of my work. So then here, this is another one. So whether we have the person that wants to read all the time and say, you know, I want to read all of the information, or the person that's saying, I just need the key takeaway point, or the person that says, okay, well, I want to know what, like, this hand is here, but what does it mean? So creating a material in a way of where it draws our community members in to just say, you know, what is it that I should be doing um, when washing my hands? Surfaces, you know, many don't think about it, but yes, like COVID, you have plastic buttons and you have zippers. And so with items that you may have on from the outside, depending on if you are around a group of people, um, may decide whether or not you want to change your clothing item. Cell phones, we all are used to using those. So imagine what a hassle that is now with gloves and masks in the conversation. Um, masks still thinking, you know, that you have to still use uh, etiquette. So to know for many that they don't just protect against everything. So then leaving the house, 
So it's already overwhelming. Um, we did these even before the mandate started to come out for the mask, but some places were still requiring masks even before it became a widespread thing. So just knowing that you should have what I would call your safety kit before you leave home, just to make sure that you can clean items that are around you before having to touch your face or come in contact with your personal environment, such as your car. So having your face mask, making sure you have hand sanitizer before and after use, um, carrying it when you can't get to a sink. And I always emphasize the brown paper bag, and you'll see that a little bit later too. So these infographics have the reoccurring themes of the hand washing, the mask, um, the brown paper bag. Of course, they're still um, continuing to socially distance, but this is important because if someone is out at a restaurant, where do you sit your mask at? You know, like that's an important question that many don't consider, but it would be unsafe for many for them to sit it down on the surface when removing it. So then, mask again. So I did a fourth article about in April. I was talking about the use of masks, specifically from the standpoint of when the guidelines came out to wear masks, how many layers they should be how to take them off, how to put them on, even washing them, understanding that some people have a sensitivity to soak. Um, some people have anxiety, you know, unfortunately. Some people uh, may feel restricted. Some people have pre-existing breathing issues. Um, a lot of different reasons, you know, that people would want to wear a mask, but they didn't quite know how to wear them. And so, I just recently got a question and it was saying, why a paper bag and why not a cloth mask? I mean, why a brown paper bag and why not a cloth bag? So the brown paper bag, the thing is, is you will want to use it one time, okay? Let's just say that you have a mask on and that's the one time that you sneeze. So the chances of the I would say snot, I'm trying to say this, but the way the snot or whatever, let's say germs that you have on that mask after sneezing and let's say some droplets get in it, you putting that inside a cloth just means that it's gonna permeate through the cloth and it's gonna permeate back onto your hands. It's not to say that that can't happen with a brown paper bag, but the brown paper bag is disposable and it's something that you should be changing out um, on a daily basis when you are using it. This is also too a common practice that we even use in healthcare when we would have like the N95 mask. It just has a lesser chance of being able to harbor the bacteria. Now understanding that like viruses don't survive well on cloth material anyway, it's just the ability for it to be able to travel through. So I hope that that answers the question. Um, so I have there again about the foam. Um, the mask causing rash, I'll be honest, like I've worn a mask and then like the whole part of my face, like where my nose is going down to my mouth, it seems like it has a different texture of skin since I've had to wear the mask because of the humidity, humidity in it. I will tell you that if your mask gets moist on the inside, you should be changing your mask out because that moisture on the inside can harbor bacteria. So it is important to make sure that you also have a dry mask. So immune system. Okay, so wait, somebody said, why do children under the age of two do not require a mask? They don't require a mask because a two-year-old has less of a chance. So we're not just talking about a two-year-old, but let's say someone that may have um, some sort of challenge, some sort of disability, um, cognitive disability, their ability to be able to keep it on safely um, and not spread is going to be challenging. Meaning like I know for sure, just even with a little cousin, putting that mask on them and them not playing with that mask um, is challenging. Also to a baby does not have the ability to tell you what they're breathing, if their breathing is compromised. So if that child is young and they're not able to express that they cannot breathe or that their breathing is challenging, then that would be the problem. 
And I see some other questions chiming in, and I promise you we'll get to them, okay? So I'll get through a couple more of these, and then I promise you we'll get through the questions. And so someone asked, is it okay that we take pictures, share these infographics with others? Absolutely. Um, that is, it is going to be available. So um, not only just through here, but the National Minority Quality Forum will also make them available as well. And so what about a plastic bag for the mask is what um, someone asked. So COVID lives on plastic, and we know that based off of the studies for up to three days, so you wouldn't want to put your mask in something like that because if the mask does have it on there, then that would be a problem um, in terms of containing the germ. So I would say no plastic. Okay. And let me see. Um, don't two-year-olds also have the ability? Yes. And so we'll talk about that in a couple. I have an infographic for that. So I'm going to go back here really quick. So many don't know in the community. So there is a such thing as marijuana being shared in the community. Um, there's a lot of controversy in terms of why some people are becoming more ill than others. And many don't know, you know, because these are common things. It might be easy to share a cigarette. It might be easy to share food. And so many don't realize that those are things that we should not be doing during this time. And honestly, like even beyond, like these are just safety measures when you don't know who's sick and who's well. Um, I know that there is a lot of information that is being shared um, pertaining to health itself. And I'm talking about the mask. So there's a heavy emphasis on the mask. There's a heavy emphasis on social distancing, but a lack of emphasis on what, should we, on what we should be doing to protect our lungs, um, good nutrition, the fact that there are studies that are showing that people that have strong T cells or built up T cells have a lesser probability of them getting COVID-19. So being able to consume foods that are high in zinc um, or high in minerals that increase the production of white blood cells and T cells to help fight off infection are important. And so again, as always, um, I'm going to keep specifying hand hygiene because our hands are the most used thing ever. And that is the one thing that can serve as a mechanism between protecting you from infection or causing you to get an infection. So home visits. Um, these infographics, again, it's not telling people, hey, we don't want you to socially distance. We don't want you to go out and work. Everyone has a different lifestyle, and so my job is not to tell people that they should stay at home and do things. It's just that if they choose to do these things or they have no choice, that they're able to do them safely. And so with home visits, some people have to come in and have services done, and they're terrified. Some may have to, um, they may have to have visitors, or they may want to have visitors. There are a lot of people that are lonely right now and need that human interaction. Um, there has been studies that have been coming out that are showing that suicide rates um, are up, depression, and just a lot of other things that are direct consequences of being at home, of stay-at-home orders um, during COVID-19. And so if someone has to have visitors, is making sure that they have safe ways that they can keep themselves safe and their visitors. And so making sure that if you're talking to someone, you have that agreement, hey, call before you come, let me know who's coming, you know, have you been around anyone that is sick? And just thinking about through what those practices will be. I always tell people, spend time outside. There's less chance of spreading droplets through open air. Yes, there are studies that talk about COVID being airborne, I have yet to see any studies that someone can get COVID from outside air if they're practicing social distancing and there's open ventilation. And so I encourage people to go outside because the chances of spread is much less. And this is based off of what we know about other viruses even prior to COVID. Doctor's visits. So if you can imagine, um, this had a different meaning for many people when you heard on the news, stay at home. That meant for some people not managing their chronic conditions. That meant, hey, you know what, I'm not going to go in for my diabetes medications because I don't want to go in and get COVID. 
I'm not going to go in and be screened for this particular condition because I don't want to risk myself. And so a lot of people compromise their health and are compromising their hair health out of fear that they can get COVID from hospital facilities. And so this was created just simply for them to still make sure that they understand how important it is for them to manage their care. Because a lot of people may feel that it's more of a risk for them to get COVID and die from COVID than it is from their chronic conditions, when in fact they both are risky if you're not managing them. And we have that topple with stress. So it provides tips like, hey, if you aren't able to do a telehealth visit, what happens when you go inside of the facility? How do you interact? Um, what should that look like for you? And so that's what this was created for um, in these spaces. And again, still sharing the same information and the um, same reoccurring themes. And so let me see. Okay, so face masks, we talked about that. We've talked about leaving home. Um, this is just, hey, if I need to go out and go shopping, what is possibly, what are some things possibly that I should do? Disinfectant spray. When I talk to people, I emphasize, I get it. All of the Lysol is possibly gone. It's probably slim to none that you can find a good disinfectant product. I simply tell them, you can put alcohol in a bottle mixed with water. You can put peroxide in a bottle mixed with water just making sure that you have something on hand that you can spray your hands down or spray your items down with is important. Um, still remembering the um, paper bag just to have while you're out. And again, it's just so you can throw that bag away. You have one less thing that you have to worry about being contaminated um, if you have a brown paper bag opposed to something that's cloth and then less of a risk for it being plastic. Um, grabbing only items that you need. I don't know about you all, but I'm still seeing people pick over produce and things crazy at the store, and I'm cringing every time, but it's just still having that reminder of washing your items when you get home, as you see, which is created in this wheel. Um, ways to check out, understanding that your card is plastic. So if you're handing your card to somebody in your hand, you know, thinking about ways that you can clean that card or trying not to handle cash leaving shoes at the door. So just really thinking through what are ways that I can keep myself safe. Same thing with assistive devices. Some people have wheelchairs. They're going to, you know, wheel over and they have canes. These are things that they have to manage while also having to manage being out in public. So just understanding how to be able to clean those things down um, I even put on here like a DIY for disinfectant um, for being able to wipe things down. Making sure that they clean their hands before and after is important. This is important for mask use. It's going to be important for glove use. The same reoccurring theme of hand hygiene is so important for all of these, but many people just may not understand how to do them in their day-to-day -day lives. And so that is the purpose of multiple infographics is because all of us can see ourselves in some of these situations. So this was, I had got the question about the two-year-old. And so this is um, the infographic for that about, you know, them not being recommended. Um, talk about avoiding places, you know, when you're with your kids in crowded places. Um, disinfectant. And so making sure that you're not cleaning your kids' items with things that are unsafe for them to put in their mouth. Because this is what happens, you know, babies want to put items in their mouth, but you may think that you want to keep them safe, um, but you want to make sure that you're not also too contaminating them with some kind of chemical. So remembering to wipe down their items. There used to be an old folks tale and he used to say, don't talk over your kid. <laughs> you know, or adults don't talk over your kids. In this situation, like we oftentimes, you know how people say, oh, and they start talking down to a baby and looking down at a baby or, or a kid. It could be three, four, five. It's just an adult, like with that over presence of a kid and talking down to them. This is not the era for that because those droplets can be falling down directly onto that child. And so I always specify that people should not talk over babies. 
Also, too, to someone else's point, and it was in the question about kids being at risk or two-year-olds being at risk for trans transmitting it. You're right. All humans are at risk for getting COVID. And maybe some symptoms for kids may not be as severe, severe as adults, but they can pass it over to others. One thing that's not specified on here, because, again, I can't include everything, is kissing your kids. So I know we're getting ready to go back to school, but what does that look like for an adult that may kiss their child that then may send their kid into school? And let's say you are the one that's contaminated with COVID and may not know. And then that kid is then with the mask and their face on and, and, and they're touching surfaces. And so these measures all come down to just decreasing the probability. Not saying don't kiss your kid, so that's not what I'm getting at. It's just specifying even to the schools that the same way that they have hand hygiene initiatives in school, they may even considering the same way we used to have to wash our hands and our face when we were eating at home may have to be something that is implemented in school just to decrease germs. And then two, people let their kids play with their phones. And so I always emphasize the phones are dirty. They're 10 times dirtier than a toilet, according to a study, a, Deloitte, a study that was done by Deloitte. So it's just one of those things that you really want to be cautious of with your kids. So community living in COVID, and I'm going to do two more of these, and then um, we'll get to some questions. Um, but community living in COVID. So some people live in high rises. We actually had a situation here locally where a lady reached out to me and said that there was rumors about COVID in her building and that by the time administration had caught wind, it went from one case up to 13 cases within the span of a week. And so they ended up being considered a CDC hotspot and they brought um, the Board of Health directly to the apartment building in order for the department building to be tested, residents to be tested for COVID. And so there are a lot of things when you're living in a community setting that puts you at risk. Um, there's the elevator button, you know, that may or may not get cleaned as often. The keypad, these things can become contaminated. One of the other things, take the stairs as much as you possibly can. So with the elevator, someone gets onto the elevator and they cough, even if it is only one person on the elevator at a time those germs can still stay suspended in air. I understand that there's no way to really get around that at this very time, but I ask, you know, how often are things like that treated? I'll tell you, one of the things that I do if I have to get on the elevator, I do carry a small bottle, small spray bottle in my purse of um, alcohol, or it'll be alcohol mixed with water, that's what I meant, or it'll be peroxide mix of water and I'll mix that into the air before I get onto an elevator. And I'll let it do it for a couple of seconds before I stay on. Um, these are practices where people do treat the air. Um, ventilation is another thing. Um, visitors washing their hair, hands when they arrive and remind them to clean their hands again when getting into the car. So there are things that we can take to just minimize our interactions that we have or not minimize our interactions that we have, but minimize the spread while we're interacting with others and having to encounter these situations. With this, we have a lot of, let's say, lower income residents in Cleveland that do reside in community living spaces and may not have this information. And so again, this information is created so they can see themselves in the scenario of being able to ask the correct questions, know what it is they should do in order to be able to keep themselves safe. Social hour. I don't know about you all, but my family, we play cards. We love cards. And, you know, it's our way of being social. Uh, we love games. This is just how people interact with each other. And so how do we do that in a safe manner? So that we can't clean the cards themselves, but there's a protocol of maybe everyone needs to clean their hands before playing. We talk stuff. We talk stuff when we're playing cards, you know? So being able to also say to yourself, how do we do that safely? You're going to laugh. You're going to interact. So just knowing how can we take measures to decrease the spread, making sure, of course, no one is exposed, 
playing outside whenever possible, utilizing math, you know, because we'll talk and we'll laugh. Um, the item may or may not be able to be cleaned, so that means that it is on everyone that is planned to make sure that they're cleaning their hands when interacting. Um, and then just making sure you're disinfecting the table. And so just in healthcare, same way we have it right now with guidelines around the state, how things have to be wiped down um, one to two times per hour, I would say the same protocol. That way, if you are talking over a table and those droplets fall down, then we're all wiping them up and we're decreasing the risk just in case someone else sits there or, um, yeah, just in case someone sits there, honestly, um, and may come in contact with those germs. So that's what I have to share. This is my contact information. Um, I'll leave it up for about a minute, but then I'm going to take it off and I'm looking forward to just interacting with you all and getting some questions answered and hearing from Mia. Wow. Well, that was that was incredible. I really appreciated all of that that you just did um, right there for us, Shanina. And um, I hope you all certainly had a lot to take away from, from all of that. Um, you know? So what I'm what I want to know, and I, I want to follow up on a couple of things, Janina, in terms of what you what you've uh, told us just now. Um, talk to us about you're talking about um, the the significance of representation in in infographics. And the other thing about infographics, about what you know, what makes them so very powerful, is that um, they are they're vivid, they're picture based, right? What does that mean in terms of health literacy, especially because we're talking about COVID nineteen being um, disproportionately uh, present and, and uh, impacting people of color, most specifically um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of, of color, Latinx. By the way, got my Myers. I just <laughs> cleaned myself, huh? You're cleaning the phone. I'm, absolutely, I'm loving it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you that that so, so I'm from Cleveland, you know, and I'm a native of from where I'm from. So the very neighborhoods that I'm trying to impact are the very neighborhoods that I grew up in and I still interact with people. So whether I'm talking to a CEO or a homeless person, you know, I'm the same person and I'm going to share the same information. And so just as I had mentioned at the beginning, I had already been submerged into this work before COVID-19 even came along, you know. So for them, it was just the overwhelming phone calls, text messages, I'm seeing you out in public and I don't know what to do. So it was the outcry from public officials, um, schools, just all types of entities like, what do I do? This is a common problem that we have among black people just as it is when we're talking about giving discharge summaries in a hospital that they can't quite digest because it's so much information coming at them at one time. It, even if it's not related to black people, think about the person that gets a cancer diagnosis and they have to make all of these split decisions within a matter of minutes and they don't quite know how to digest that. So we gave America a crash course of infection prevention information overnight saying, hey, clean your hands, socially distance, adjust your whole life and put your whole life on hold. And so many people didn't know what to do with that. And so you had some people that said, oh, no, this is fake, it's a conspiracy, and it's, it's false. You had some that decided that they were going to go in and be a hermit, and this was the end of the world and everything was over. You had some that said, you know what, I still have to go out and I have to eat. These essential workers are nine times out of ten going to be of lower income. They are not making wages, you know, that have allowed them to be able to stay home during a time of a pandemic. So when I was out in the stores and out doing things that required me to be out in a community, I said to myself, these are individuals that are human beings just like me. Some of them probably have been my patients before that don't quite know how to keep themselves safe. And I need to provide something to where it is digestible, not just readable, visually appealing in order for them to be able to see themselves in a scenario. And so that's where the infographics um, came from. How about for limited English proficient uh, persons living, living amongst us and in our families and so on and so forth? Yes. 
So these are created to where a kid can understand them and say, mommy, daddy, look at this and be able to visually put things together um, for that very reason. There are other, let's say, populations that I have not gotten to, um, Hispanic, which is huge in my area. Like this can is something that can be converted to different languages. Um, and I haven't made it that far. Again, this is not even my research. So this is not my research area whatsoever. Like that's a whole nother aspect of my life. This honestly is just me doing community work, which, you know, so we're, you know, we're very uh, innate to do. So that's what this is. So. And I really have to commemorate you for, for taking this upon you. Cause I, as you said, you, this isn't, this isn't your line, your lines work. I mean, as a, as a, your clinical researcher, you're an infection preventionist, but you also do see and are feeling the need with respect to not only um, health literacy, right? So people understanding and really taking in and processing the information without anxiety, um, but then also uh, looking at that language aspect as you're building your your um, your impact up. I just encourage you to keep going because this is this is really powerful stuff, and uh, and I think um, everyone on the call can also um, echo that they they want to see the slide. So please share this information, people within your networks and so on and so forth. I want to talk to you about um, two things that you brought up in your, in your slide deck, uh, especially because, well, three things really. So you talked about the mental health aspect, right? The, the significance of isolation. And, and as a consequence, people are probably leaving their houses to hopefully socially distance in a safe way, right? Here in DC, yeah. A lot of the um, restaurants have opened up their outdoor dining spaces and some of them even have indoor dining but they have their windows open and such and so in one of your slides you were emphatic it was a slide with the man who had his mask on his nose and he pulled it down on his chin and his you know his you were saying that the, this area right here was exposed therefore it carried germs and so what you don't want to do is keep pulling your mask on and off you said to just take off the mask completely if you're eating but a lot yeah. of the restaurants uh, here in DC are saying they want you to put the mask on whenever you're, whenever the, the server or, or waiter or waitress comes by. Um, and so can you talk to us about how we can be self-advocates in those spaces to say, you know, um, I've, I've come out, but maybe restaurants should can reconsider their, their practices or how do you navigate that space? Because, yeah. So I'll be honest, I with grocery stores here. So the grocery store experience that I had was not ideal for the workers and it wasn't ideal for people being able to come in. So I've seen practices in restaurants. So for one, I'm so happy because it's taken like over a decade now <laughs> for us to finally get to a place where we're not using the same um, menus and the same condiments, you know, that everyone else is exposed to during the whole time. So that is something that I am happy to see has changed. Um, for the restaurants that are asking you to put the materials on when you're sitting there in your seat and they're having to come past, that is an inconvenience to you. I think two things should happen. Um, I've seen it work to whereas you keep your mask on until you make it to your designated sitting area which should be six feet or more apart away from the other parties. And when you're there and you're interacting with someone, then you're supposed to be able to take your mask off at that time. They are supposed to keep their mask on and still be able to socially distance in a way of where they're not talking down to you when taking your order. So they should not be hovering over you while, you're, while they're taking your order. And that's even with the mask on. So on top of them not hovering over you with that mask, the other thing is the ventilation. So if you mentioned, if the restaurant has like open windows, if you're able to sit outside, that's great. Like that is perfectly fine because what that means is that that ventilation and that airflow is great. Now, if it's a closed in space, okay, and I would be concerned, I'll be honest. Like I know that there was one study that came out, not even a study, it was uh, article that came out about everyone in a particular restaurant becoming contaminated and the commonality was the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. So ventilation is a big deal. 
if it's ventilation, if it's in an open space, then I think it's a safe place to um, be. But if you see someone that's not doing correct practices, then you should question them. I, I completely agree. Yeah, making having those questions at the ready and being an advocate for yourself if you so decide to go outside and safely social distance. Let me ask you also about hand sanitizers, right? So there was recently this whole uh, big thing and blow up in the media about um, FDA having to recall a, a lot of hand sanitizer, right? So how, how should people be considered with respect to um, cleaning solutions? And I really like how you were talking about self-empowerment around making your own if you're able. So white vinegar, um, alcohol, and water, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, um, so methanol is not safe. And what you're finding is, and I would caution anyone um, to look at the ingredients. And if you don't see the ingredients, it's okay to ask for what's called an MSDS. So it's a material safety and data sheet. I know that that's sometimes like really challenging to do when you are out on the fly and you see some hand sanitizer on the wall and you think that you just wanna go and use it because it is accessible. Everything is not safe. It isn't safe. So we did have these rules around how hand sanitizer should have been made. But if you notice, those rules got very relaxed when there started to be a shortage. Um, I know that you see a current emphasis in the slides about hand washing. I continue to emphasize hand washing because soap and water is the safest thing, especially in the current climate where you don't know if someone is putting methanol and other stuff inside of the hand sanitizers, which could either give you a bad skin reaction. Some of this stuff is so potent in terms of smell that it can make you pass out. So it is important to know what it is that you're using. So I do agree with that in that I do see a lot of recalls from FDA, rightfully so, but it just means that a lot more work has to be um, done to make sure that you're safe and that you know what you're purchasing. Well, speaking of hands, can you talk to us a little bit more about glove use? I do not recommend glove use unless you are coming in contact with let's say some sort of drainage or something that is overall unsafe, similar to how we was doing before, I do not recommend glove use. Gloves will have you touching things and transferring germs without you even knowing it. Our hands have a normal flora, okay? Or, and our normal flora is what is the good bacteria. So we have good bacteria in our hand that is going to fight for us. That is our, our integumentary system, like it's great. Okay, those bad bacteria, which can attach to our skin, we still have our good bacteria that are fighting against those. Gloves do not have that barrier on there. So when you have gloves, similar to how I showed the video with the hand hygiene and the ink, imagine that ink. So I was showing you how to do correct hand hygiene in that video, but take that same video and imagine how much ink was covering those hands and think about that as being the bio burden of gloves from touching constant things overall and picking up germs from other spaces. It's not to scare people, but I have to let you all know that superbugs didn't go away, which means that we're talking about multi-drug resistant organisms that were around before COVID-19 came. Um, we're talking about different funguses and different bacteria. These things have been here, okay? It did not disappear. And so you using these gloves means not only are you concerned about COVID-19, but you should be concerned about the bio burden of other pathogens that you potentially pick up by utilizing those gloves. Again, I'm gonna emphasize that hand hygiene is the best way for you to keep your hands safe. And I think it is crazy and also just really disturbing that only three to six percent of people wash their hands correctly. Yes. Yeah. And that. I'm actually, people say, oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm that person that hurries up and scrubs real quick and trying to get out somewhere. Or you have some people that said that they actually do the full 20 to 25 seconds and they only rub the front and the back of the hands and they never think about the fingertips or the thumbs or the wrist. Mm -hmm. So 
it's it's actually it's a technique to it that we have to do. Yeah, we have to do it. And I also think about our, you know, our our fellow Americans who don't necessarily have consistent running water or clean water in their homes, right? Or um, especially when we're talking about COVID and and First Nations areas and particularly in Navajo Nation and on reservations, access to water is an issue. So in a lot of ways, I mean, again, COVID and what we already know, and you, you're you an expert at this, COVID-19 has just completely exacerbated these structural components that either enable us to make healthy decisions or, or really put us, put us uh, render us um, more vulnerable to, to the conditions of COVID. Um, I wanna go back a little bit, Dr. Knighton, and talk about children, right? So this is August come tomorrow, and a lot of people are, I know, right? Time is flying by. A lot of people are preparing their children to either go back to school or, um, or, and or attend school virtually, right? So talk to us a little bit about what your overall thoughts on are when, um, on our young people going back to school at the end of the summer. So a couple of things. So one thing I'm going to mention to everyone um, is flu is coming off a of vacation, okay? And there is a possibility, a high possibility, or there isn't anything standing in the way of being able to get flu and COVID at the same time. So we know how harmful COVID can be, and we know that it's respiratory related. We know that influenza has its impact and can be respiratory related you do not want to get both of them, okay? And so I'm mentioning those things when we're talking about kids going back to school because the same way we saw that the influenza numbers were up, I anticipate those numbers to still continue to be up but now also complicated by COVID. So with our kids going back in August, honestly, with some um, doing virtual, some are doing virtual and some are doing in-person. Um, their social distancing, some have practices put in place. I continue to emphasize the different school systems to make sure, and parents, if you are sending your kids back, make sure that it is simulated, meaning they're not just doing virtual planning calls and saying this is how things are gonna go, but these people have boots on the ground running and they're actually planning, just like we would do with emergency preparedness, they should actually be doing simulations and making sure that things are going to go exactly how they say that they're going to go. Many people have different reasons for why they need to send their kids to school. My role is to just make sure that they help them to do it safely. I do not think that schools are going to be open um, into the winter. I think that everything is gonna go virtual. So a lot of the models that I've seen, they're starting their kids out the first semester or first trimester or first marking period, um, however they term it, they're starting them out at the beginning and then they're transitioning online. I am not opposed to that for it as long as there's not full capacity of the school. There are some kids that do need to have physical interaction with their teachers and may need to make friends before transitioning to the virtual environment to become more comfortable. And so there are a lot of different varying opinions on it, it definitely comes down to each individual school and how they plan on going about it. Well, I know we're, we're coming up on our time right now, and Dr. Shanina Knighton, thank you so very much for coming to just grace us with your, your overall presence and also just bringing us this really very concrete, comprehensive information. And I see Brandon is removing his mask in the way that he's supposed to from <laughs> ear to ear. And um, and so Roy, I really I'm really excited about you joining us, and hopefully you'll come back and, and talk to us another time. And uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll turn it over to Brandon to uh, to close us out for the day. And oh, thank no. you all for joining in the audience. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, both of you, Dr. Knight, and specifically, I really appreciate. It. I, I've, I've sort of realized the mistakes I've made, and honestly, the money I've wasted. <laughs> Um, during this process, like just buying everything I could and some of it not being effective. And so just getting, you know, some alcohol and water and going, doing that in the elevator instead of spraying Lysol everywhere I go. Um, so I really do appreciate it. I'm also you wondering- You Lysol? Where do you find Lysol? That's fine. So I, so I was lucky. I'm a, I was, I'm a Costco guy. So I literally, I don't know, like at the beginning of the year, we go to Costco and I buy a bunch of stuff and I just had the Clorox wipes and the Lysol and everything ahead of time. <laughs> 
So just random. Um, but no, I just want to also thank Dr. Knight. And she, um, we were trying to, we're still trying to figure out a way to acknowledge her in her class. She's a, a 2020 awardee of our 40 under 40. And so she's been amazing. And we've actually had um, a couple of other of her uh, uh, cohorts, her colleagues in that class speak. And you can just see how amazing we continue to get these amazing people um, that are really about the business of, you know, ending health disparities and just making sure everyone is, uh, can get help, can have healthy outcomes. So I just want to thank you for that and all you do, uh, Mia, as always. And then everyone, I don't, Dr. Knight, would you mind if we share these on our website or is there a way you want us to get this distributed to um, folks? Your, the uh, graphics that you share today? Yes, yeah, so I'll be happy. I just want to say, and I'm very excited because I will be working, I am working with leadership from um, in, in, in MQF to make sure that these are available um, on their platforms and for their initiatives. So I'm thinking that maybe Dr. Puckern will tell us whether or not he wants to share my branded material or the NMQF branded material with the audience. And so um, once we hear that, then I will we'll find out if we should go ahead and put it up. All right. Well, def we're definitely going to share information uh, with you all about this because this is super necessary. Keiko and I were sort of in the back room saying, okay, we might not need to have her come again. Just. <laughs> just to keep educating us and reminding us. So uh, lastly, just finally, thank you everyone. Have a good weekend and we appreciate you uh, spending your Friday, an hour of your Friday afternoon with us. Have a good day.